Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Idol Podcast, the podcast where I do weekly book reviews. This week, I read the Articles of Confederation. So much like the Declaration of Independence, this is a short read. It'll be a short analysis, and it's strictly for informational purposes. If you ever wondered what this document did, or if you didn't listen in history class, this is a great refresher for you. Now, again, I have a compilation book. So this thick book here, um, it's not all um, composed of only the Articles of Confederation. It also has the Declaration of Independence and the American Crisis. And unintentionally, we're actually going in chronological order here because the Articles of Confederation came after the Declaration of Independence and before the Constitution, which is next up on my list to read and analyze. So God help me with that. But let's get into our review. So this is the document that created the actual title, the United States of America. So it created that name and it created the structure, kind of a flimsy structure at first, but a structure nonetheless. It was originally written by Benjamin Franklin in 1775, but it went through various different drafts afterwards. So I would say like, you know, everyone probably could lay claims to help writing this document. Now, I will say one difference between this and the Declaration is it's less about the content of the document and it's more of the tediousness concerning creating a nation. Also, Kitty Boo Boo is in the background acting a fool again. So if you hear, you know, a little pitter patter, that's her. Okay, so. The necessity of, in this document lies in the question of what now? So at this point, the Declaration had established the severing of ties from Great Britain. Now it's time to literally build that nation. So really, this is the beginning, the very beginning stages of creating a federal government, which you know is needed in order to establish leadership to maintain some type of cohesion and in the early years of the united states there was an emphasis on unity so you'll see well obviously i guess looking at the title the united states um, you can see just how much of a um what's the word i'm looking for how much of a necessity that was for the founders that the states all had some type of union. Now, the document was agreed upon on November 15th, 1777. And this basically just means that it was generally agreed upon by the representatives. However, it wasn't put into force until after Maryland, the last state, ratified it on March 1st, 1781. So each state obviously had to ratify this for overall enforcement. So again, there's that whole emphasis on unity. Now this eventually led to the creation of the Constitution. Um, in 1787, Congress Congress wished to revise the articles. They decided to create something completely new though. So at first they were gonna kind of expound upon what they had already started, but then they realized they need to just write an entirely new document and that would become the Constitution. Kitty Boo Boo's acting up. She's acting up, okay. All right, so. When we talk about the overall structure of the document, there are 13 articles, very short. Most of them are like a paragraph or so. Again, this is an informative and a procedural piece. 
just to give you an example of that, um, in a couple of the articles, I should say, there is somewhat of a map of the appeal process that they wanted to put into place when it came to settling disputes. So, for example, and this is a very general um, process that they came up with, but you know it's necessary because you know at some point there's going to be some type of conflict, you know, between states, and so they need to establish how they're going to handle it. So, when it comes to the appeals process at this point, Congress was seen as the last resort for appeals. And this, you know, was concerning state versus state issues. So what would happen is if there wasn't a resolution to be found without Congress, the states would then petition to Congress for assistance after Congress accepts. um, The states together are tasked with appointing the judges to preside over the case. And this is when it gets really annoying. So if the states can't agree, Congress picks three people from each state, they create a list, and then the two states that are in conflict take turns striking out names until they come down to only 13. Of that 13, between seven and nine are brought to Congress, and then Congress selects five that preside over the case. So this all ends up with five people being appointed to look over this case. And the judges, you know, have to take an oath against favor and bias, and then the court tries the case and pronounces the sentencing. So this is something that when you read it, it's kind of a terrible process, but I mean... Well, not terrible. I should say it's more of a prototype process because they just were trying to figure things out as they went at this point. But that reinforces the idea that it was necessary to write it down because there was a very high probability that there was going to be conflicts between states. Because if we take it back to when they were colonies, there was already um, somewhat of an understanding that everyone was kind of functioning separately. So in order to make everyone one big happy family, you're going to have to settle some type of process to um, resolve uh, disputes. Now what this document establishes is first the title, the United States of America, um, state sovereignty, which is just essentially state power, states um, In this document are told that they have an obligation to other states to extradite any criminals that you know may have committed a crime in their home states and they're just trying to run from the law okay well now because we are united if someone is on the run it is your responsibility to turn them over as well as state jurisdiction when it came to property um, and boundaries especially There was an emphasis on this league of friendship, and that's actually what they said in the document. So essentially, the general interest of the whole over just one um, individual state. And then lastly, probably the biggest thing that was repeatedly um, touched on was congressional representation. So it did set... uh, guidelines for the representatives and how they conducted themselves. For example, you cannot be a rep and earn monies elsewhere. Um, You can't accept a title of nobility elsewhere from some other country and serve, you know, as a representative for the United States of America. That's not going to work because conflict of interest. But also that these representatives cannot enter a treaty on behalf of the people without the proper backup, which is also outlined uh, generally. Basically, it just means that all the states have to agree before you go and sign a treaty on behalf of everyone. But also it discusses you know, the con- Congress's role in land boundaries and disputes, um, the Court of Appeals with that early uh, structure that I just discussed, Congress cannot engage in war and the power of nine out of 13 states. That was a reoccurring thing. Essentially, um, 
it was almost like a majority rules thing, but basically if nine out of the 13 states are for it, then you know they're probably gonna run with it. But again, these are all very early um, kind of ideals. And what we see is that not too long after this, it didn't really last that long until they decided they needed to revise it, whether to make some things more specific or adjust approaches to situations that weren't working previously. Now, the states, you should probably know this by now, but the states that signed um, this document included New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, Delaware, New York, Maryland, New Jersey, Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So all of their representatives came together to create and enforce this document. Now the intent is very clear to cement the structure of the US, very cut and dry. When it comes to my review, which again is slightly strange, I don't think anyone really cares what I have to say about the Articles of Confederation because it's not meant for someone to enjoy it. <laughs> it just is what it is, it's a piece. Um, I think it's, again, it's an example of one of those necessary and tedious pieces of policy that establish order in a new nation. So if you were someone who was caught up in the hype of, oh, you know, we're independent, we're free, but you gotta figure some stuff out and you gotta do it very quickly because you don't wanna wait too long without order, especially in the, the precarious position that the colonies were in. You don't wanna just sit there and wait for somebody else to come take over. So you need to establish some type of strong leadership. I think if anything, um, mainly because this document wasn't really enforced for very long because the Constitution came and it's just like this, it, it doesn't really matter anymore because the Constitution was like a new and improved version. This will show the audience where, you know, the power for the Constitution is pulling from. You know, this is like the first draft essentially, which in itself went through several revisions. So it's kind of funny. So I, I definitely think, especially because this, this is much shorter than the Constitution, that this is a good place to start if you want to start exploring historical documents. That way you'll understand um, more of what's going on later on in the Constitution. So, you know, basically much needed to be established. The articles were almost a draft to hold things in place temporarily, and that's exactly what they did. Now I say all that to say, um, you know, it was kind of boring. I probably won't reread it, not because there's not, you know, important information, but just, you know, there's not much really to learn from this document outside of early congressional powers. And there's an emphasis on early because again, things were revised, you know, a decade later. So things changed. A lot of what's written in this document no longer applies. Whereas the Constitution, even with all of its amendments, that's still, you know, in play here. So this isn't really, it's not necessary, I don't think, that you read this document. I do think it's, it's like a, it's like an introduction to a book or something. You know, you don't really have to read it. I'm sure you can understand the rest of U.S. history without this particular document, but, you know, it certainly helps. I do think that the declaration is obviously more important. It was more entertaining, and I know it wasn't supposed to be, but I enjoyed that more than this one. So yeah, um, it may be difficult for people to under, not understand, um, to catch the flow of this because most of which is discussed in this document it's changed. The general core principles are still there, obviously. There's still an emphasis on um, quote unquote unity, um, but also a, a balance of powers and trying to ensure that, you know, tyranny won't form. So there's that. But yeah, I think 
the only takeaway I have here is that there's an astounding amount of effort and time that went into maintaining the U.S. after the war, after the Revolutionary War. And probably that's probably a true statement for the Civil War as well. You know, post-war, whether you won or lost, that's a really complicated time period because you need to now establish any order that was lost in the struggle of war. And in this case, they were kind of building from scratch. So defeating Britain didn't magically make everything just and everything perfect and, you know, apples and cherries and stuff. So, and we, we know that to be true because the civil war comes a few decades later. And then if you really want to take it a step further, you can just take a look at how, everything's running right now. Um, but, you know, I think that's also an important comment on maintaining a country and just, you know, the maintenance that goes into ensuring the structure is stable. Sometimes you have to change things. Sometimes things have to be rewritten or revised. I know we have amendments to the Constitution, but, you know, maybe every now and then we need to reevaluate how our country is running and changing, and then go from there, write up some more documents. So yeah, that was, that's probably the only thing I really got from this. It's a pretty dry document, pretty boring. The declaration was better, but you know, it doesn't matter what I think. So anyway, next week I will be reviewing the importance of being earnest. This is actually a, um, a stage play. And it's cool because I'm excited that, you know, this this has been around for a while. So um, there's like clips on YouTube of this play. There's probably a movie about it, um, but I, I like to see like the actors in action. So I know there's a full free version on YouTube that hopefully by the time I finish reading this, I've watched the entire thing. So that'll be the next thing I review. Um, I have my pile over here of stuff that I'm reading at the same time. I have um, Showdown, Thurgood Marshall, and the Supreme Court nomination that changed America. I have Coriolanus, Lanus, Shakespeare. Um, I think a few writing books and some other stuff. But yeah, so um, I have a few historical fiction and nonfiction pieces that I'm probably going to read. I'm in that that groove of reading history right now. So any suggestions, you know, let me know. Like always, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, please rate um, the podcast. You just scroll, I think, all the way down to the bottom and you should see stars. You can rate and review. If you are watching on YouTube, you can like and comment. On Spotify, I don't know if Spotify has ratings quite yet, but yeah, and follow the podcast on Instagram. That's the one I update the most, and that's at a.idolpodcast, and that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Also, can we have a moment for the shirt? Dwight Schrute. Yeah, that's it. That's all, and that's how we're going to end the podcast. See you all next week. Thank you.